everybody. Welcome to Health Hackers. I'm Gemma Evans, journalist and presenter in the UK. This is my series spotlighting pioneering and unique figures in health. Today, I am at the Public Health Collaborations Annual Conference in Central London and I'm joined by my guest, Dr. Trudy Deacon. Trudy's speaking here a little bit later on this morning, but you very kindly agreed to do a Health Hackers interview with us first, so we're very grateful. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Trudy. She is a registered dietitian specialising in the prevention and management of conditions like metabolic syndrome, obesity and type 2 diabetes. She's also the chief executive of the charity Expert Health. She's trained more than 1,500 healthcare professionals mm -hmm. who have gone on to educate over 250,000 people Correct, yes. who are either <laughs> um, living with or, have, or who are at risk of type 2 diabetes. Yes. And she's also an author. So uh, welcome to Health Hackers. Okay. Uh, so you've become known for turning conventional dietary advice upside down, really. Um, how did how did that come to be? Tell us the backstory. Well, it all started with education, really, because I qualified as a dietitian back in 1993. Started to work in the NHS as a dietitian. Almost immediately specialised in diabetes, and I was seeing children with diabetes, adults, and even the elderly in residential homes. And it soon became apparent that people didn't understand what happened to food when they ate it and what impacted on their blood glucose levels. They thought it was all about sugar and just sugar. And so I started to ask people what information would help them better understand their diabetes and more importantly, how they wanted that information to be delivered. And what I heard loud and clear is that they didn't want to come to a clinic and just be given with a diet sheet. They wanted to understand and have a chance to discuss their, their requirements and their diet. So I started to run one-off group sessions and evaluate them and uh, got pregnant, went, planned pregnancy, went off on mat leave and uh, had an exceedingly good child who is now 20 years old um, and uh, put together a six-week package of education and uh, went back to work four months later and was told that I couldn't implement it because I was doing nine clinics a week and there was no time and it wasn't evidence-based. I didn't really know anything about research in those days so I started to do some research modules at Lancaster University and applied for funding and it took me about three years to get funding to um, do my doctorate and do also a clinical trial to test out whether the package of education worked and so I went to the University of Leeds, I did the clinical trial and the results were outstanding. The uh, group that were invited to attend the group education, 95% of them attended, so an excellent take-up rate. And they did so much better than the group that had the, the control group that had the individual appointments with the dietitian, nurse and, and doctor. Uh, at four months and at 14 months and we looked at uh, the clinical indicators like blood glucose control uh, and weight as well as quality of life indicators as well, validated questionnaires and empowerment. And it got published and it won some national awards and other people started to want it and uh, other NHS trusts started to contact me and say we would like to implement this programme. So that was the start of Expert really. So it wasn't just started out with being kind of turning conventional wisdom on diet on its head, it was initially turning conventional wisdom on education on its head because group education wasn't the norm in those days. So through my work I was quite instrumental in, in kind of producing the evidence for NICE and then making it a NICE guidance that all people with diabetes should be offered good quality and evidence-based structured education. So that was the start of everything and then the, the turning the conventional wisdom around diet on its head came after that. Oh, well tell us about that. Tell us what, so what was special about this program then that was so different that you devised? Because I think we focused on carbohydrate and we didn't focus on sugar. Okay. So uh, week one is all about diabetes and we talk about high insulin levels and insulin resistance. 
Week two, we introduce nutrition for health and we offer dietary flexibility. So we don't say one size fits all, everyone has to follow a low fat diet. We say there's different dietary approaches and different things work for different individuals. And then the whole of week three is about carbohydrate awareness and what are carbohydrates, where do we get them from, how do they impact on your blood glucose levels. So we talk about glycemic index, glycemic load, the amount of carbohydrate being the most important factor. And we also talk about fats and how fats aren't bad for us and fats are essential to life. So it's all evidence-based information that all dietitians know but we actually get it across to people in an easy to understand way that they can implement it. Now somebody who is watching or listening to this who doesn't have type 2 diabetes might think well I don't need to listen to this doesn't apply to me but can you remind us just how much of a risk type 2 diabetes could be for any of us? Yes, I mean, uh, there's now uh, over 4 million people with type 2 diabetes diagnosed, um, but, and that's 1 in 15 adults. Uh, but there's 12.3 million people at risk of developing diabetes, which is huge. But then there's a the metabolic syndrome. So even if people have got normal blood glucose levels, then they may have an increased waist circumference, they may have increased fats in their blood called triglycerides, they may have increased blood pressure, and they may have uh, reduced of the HDL, uh, the carrier of cholesterol that's considered healthy. And if people have three out of five of those clinical indicators outside the target range, then they have the metabolic syndrome. Now the metabolic syndrome is an insulin resistant condition and so people making dietary changes about what they eat and when they eat is going to help them to eliminate uh, that metabolic syndrome. So you know two thirds of the population are overweight so two thirds of the population it's likely that they've got insulin resistance. And would you also call that kind of pre-diabetes? Well, pre-diabetes focuses solely on blood glucose levels. And there's a lot of people that have normal blood glucose levels but are still at risk or still have the metabolic syndrome. So they may, in decades of time, they may develop pre-diabetes and then go on to develop type 2 diabetes. So we know that the high insulin levels and the insulin resistance is the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then you know, one or two or three decades later, the glucose control can start to deteriorate. But what we've tended to do in the UK and worldwide is concentrate on the symptoms. So concentrate on the blood glucose levels, which are the symptoms when it all goes wrong, rather than concentrate on the cause, the starting point, which is the high insulin levels and the insulin resistance. So there are a lot of people who really need to pay attention to this because there yes. could be a risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, tell us a bit about how you then became known as this uh, thought leader turning dietary advice on its head because you told us about the education package that you started offering mm -hmm. and then what came beyond that? Um, I think when you start to deliver information that doesn't tie in totally with the dietary guidelines then people start to pick up on it and I think the probably the most controversial message that we give is around fats so I think it's generally accepted now that diabetes is a carbohydrate intolerant condition especially type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes and so that's generally accepted but if people uh, reduce their carbohydrate intake to their tolerant level so they can meet their blood glucose levels uh, targets by doing that then they tend to need to replace it with something now if an individual is wanted to because they'd, they'd still be hungry yes yeah. yes yes so when people need to lose weight then uh, they, they don't want to lose muscle they want to lose fat and so when people um, start to change their diet, some of their fuel is going to come from the stalled fat and that will allow them to lose weight. But what we see is when people 
reduce their carbohydrate intake, so start to follow a low carbohydrate diet. So they might cut out bread and or cereals, and pasta, and pasta yeah, yeah, potatoes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and if they don't um, replace it with anything, they go hungry. Mm -hmm. And then the diet isn't sustainable. And if people replace it with protein, protein can cause people to be, feel too full. So protein levels, you know, a low carbohydrate diet is a moderate protein diet, but it's not a high protein diet. So people need to fuel off fat. Now that fat is either dietary fat or stored fat in their body, and it normally is a combination of the two. Now, um, we uh, encourage people to eat fat to satiety, so to fullness, to true physiological fullness and not emotional fullness. Mm. And so that means that their fat intake increases. But we don't stipulate that they need to have, um, to, to reduce saturated fat. So, you know, we've got different types of fat in the body. We've got the uh, polyunsaturated fat, we've got the monounsaturated fat, and we've got the saturated fat. Now, the polyunsaturated fats tend to come either from um, seeds and nuts or oily fish. So we've got the omega-6 and the omega-3. A lot of people have too much of the omega-6 through the vegetable oils and they're very, very highly processed and they're prone to damage in the body because the, the, the double bonds um, are not stable and so that cause, can cause inflammation in the body. Can you give us some examples of some omega-6s? Would it be sunflower oil? Yeah, so eating nuts and seeds in the natural form is absolutely fine. But when people, uh, a lot of the processed foods nowadays and the fast foods are cooked in the uh, seed of vegetable oils like the sunflower oil, the rapeseed oil, the corn oil, um, and, and you buy the vegetable oil from the supermarket, that's mainly polyunsaturated fat, the omega-6. And the processing from the seeds into the oil is very, very ugly. So they've added, um, you know, um, um, they've added hexane and things like that, and uh, they've bleached and deodorized the oil. So what you actually see in the bottle at the end is not a healthy product at all, and it's not stable. So as soon as you cook with it, it becomes um, oxidized. What do you cook with? Um, so natural oil, so fats that are in their natural form are more stable. So uh, you can cook with the extra virgin olive oil, you can cook with the stable fats such as the dripping, the lard, um, coconut oil, coconut oil, butter. Yes, yes. And uh, and you were telling us about the other types of fats. We did polyunsaturated, mm -hmm. uh, and then the saturated fats. Yes, and then the so the other type of the polyunsaturated is the omega three. Right. And the best source of omega three is from the oily fish. Um, but you can get some from the flaxseed and, and things like that. So if you're vegetarian, you can get it, but it's not quite in the active form. So the oily fish is the best way to get the omega-3. Okay, so yeah. we want omega-3s, we want to limit omega-6. Yeah. So we want the ratio between the, uh, before the agricultural revolution, the ratio between the omega-6 and the omega-3 was like one to one. And now it's like 16 to one. So we need what, to with the six being bigger. Yes. Oh right. Yeah. Okay. So we need to have more of the omega three and less of the omega six. Okay. To rebalance. Then we have the monounsaturated. So the extra virgin olive oil is a really really good source of the monounsaturated, which is more stable, and so you can cook with the extra virgin olive oil, no problem. It's more stable to heat. And then there's the saturated fat that you get um, from the uh, animal products and the coconut oil as well. And other saturated fats would be cheeses, yes. eggs, fatty meats. So was it controversial for you then to suggest that people can be reintroducing these fats into their diets? Because we've grown up, I mean, I've grown up in an era yeah. which has been low fat, low calorie. Yeah. I think I used to be a fat phobic dietitian myself. Um, so my family laughed that I now eat butter <laughs> and I never used to do. Um, but when you look at the research, they say that half of what you learn at university is incorrect, but at that time you don't know which half is incorrect. And that's certainly true with saturated fat myself. When I looked in detail at saturated fats, I realised there's 36 different types of saturated fat and they all have different properties in our body. And so you've got the short chain fatty acids, the medium chain fatty acids, the long chain. So that they all have different properties and impact on our body differently. Then you have the odd chain and the even chain. So it's really, really quite complex. 
Now the short chain fatty acids tend to be taken up by our gut and so they don't tend to get into our circulation. They feed our gut microbiota and our gut cells. So that's really, really mm. good stuff. And we find the short chain fatty acids in the full fat milk and dairy. And there's been a lot of research now to suggest that people who have the more of the full fat milk and dairy actually have a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Then we have the medium chain fatty acids and they are taken direct to the liver where they're processed for energy immediately. So that's why a lot of people doing exercise will have the MCT oil. Mm -hmm. um, so coconut oil has got a large proportion of the medium chain fatty acids. So they don't tend to get stored in the body. So it's more the long chain fatty acids that are taken up by our fat cells, by our mm. adipose tissue. And if you don't need it for energy, they tend to be stored. So what foods would have the long chain in that we would probably want to limit? Um, so the longer chain, well actually, converting carbohydrate into fat leads more of the long chain fatty acids. So when people over consume carbohydrate, then in the liver, you initially store it as glycogen, the carbohydrate storage, but if the gly glycogen stores become full, you then convert it into triglyceride, which is fat. And you know, a quarter of the population now have evidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that tends to come, we call it de novo lipogenesis. So that's the, de novo means new, lipogenesis means production of fat. So the new production of fat in the liver is more likely to come from carbohydrates than it is from fat. Now it produces the uh, chain length of saturated fat 16 to 18 chain length, so longer fatty acids, which have been shown to be more harmful for us, but it's not from the fat that you eat, it comes from over-consuming so carbohydrates. Yes. So with the short chain fatty acids, they are in butter? Yes. Is that right? Any yes. other foods you could name yeah. and check for Cheese. Us? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we should just point out that at this public health collaboration, we're here very early before um, mm. Trudy's talk. Uh, would you agree that most of the people here want to see some kind of up, updating to the conventional dietary guidelines, the kind of ones that, that you see from the NHS? Yes. Now, if, if you were going to rewrite the dietary guidelines, what would you list? What would they look like? The ideal guidelines for people to be eating? Diabetes UK, in their update of their nutritional guidelines last year, have already done it in the way that now they're suggesting that there should be dietary flexibility, that one size doesn't fit all and that different diets suit different individuals. And so that's brilliant. And so I fully endorse that. Um, I think the, the only sticking point now is around the saturated fat. And when I looked at the evidence, then yes, some of the saturated fats are harmful for, for us, but they've been produced from the carbohydrate. And when they have done a, a looked at a Cochrane systematic review um, and looked at dietary saturated fat, there was no evidence at all that dietary saturated fat increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So that now should be put to bed. So if I was going to rewrite the dietary guidelines, then uh, it would be certainly around dietary flexibility, but also it would be to remove the low fat dietary guidelines. So you would really say that one set of guidelines can't fit everybody? No. No, we're all uh, and you would want to bring in some some saturated fats. I, I would so no, remove the low fat emphasis, okay. and uh, you know fat is an essential nutrient. We need it in the body. Carbohydrate isn't an essential nutrient, um, and so to remove the emphasis on, on a low fat diet. Well, I think a lot of people will think, well, if I if I eat more fat, then aren't I going to get fat? Well, that's a common myth, and um, I can understand why people would think that, but um, that's because people don't understand that if we consume other nutrients to excess, we then convert them into fat in the body, you know? And also, the low-fat diet has done a lot of damage. So the low-fat diet became a dietary guideline in the 1983. And what happens since then is that people have started to eat more frequently. So people have a low-fat breakfast cereal. It doesn't keep them feeling full for long. 
So then they have a mid mid morning snack and then they have lunch and then they have a mid afternoon snack and then they have evening meal and they have supper. So people have started to eat more frequently. So people, my grandparents used to have three square meals a day. Now it's quite normal for people to eat at six or seven occasions a day, grazing throughout the day. Even grazing on fruit, what that does is that increases our insulin levels in our body. Now, if we're in the fed state, our body is storing energy. If we're in the fasted state, then our body is using that stored energy. We can't do both at the same time. Now, if people are wanting to lose weight, they need to be using their stored energy. But if they're grazing throughout the day, they're storing energy, not using their fat stores as an energy source. So it's not just what we eat, it's how frequent we eat. And so the, the problem with the low fat diet is eating frequency is increased. It's putting people in fat storage mode. And so now two thirds of the population are overweight one in four adults are obese and that's you know quadrupled in the last few decades so that's a huge problem let's talk about your presentation today will you t tell us what the, the title right. of your presentation is the title of the presentation is eat less move more and get fat because what has been forgotten is that calories in and calories out are linked so if people eat less and move more generally by adopting a low fat diet and eating frequently, then they create an energy deficit and they will lose weight in the short term. So all diets are successful in the short term, but what people forget is that calories out don't keep stable. So if people are eating frequently and they're having, based on their meals on carbohydrate, insulin levels are high. Insulin is an energy storage hormone. So if they're storing that energy and they have dropped their calories to around, you know, someone needs 2,000 calories and they drop their calories to 1,500. If their body is storing that energy, then there isn't the energy available for them to use. So what does the body do? It then compensates, conserves calories and slows down. So the basal metabolic rate slows down to 1500 calories. So people, someone's taking 15 calories in and their metabolic rate drops to only burning 1500 calories. So what happens to that weight loss? It plateaus. And the person doesn't understand that, so they go, I've stopped losing weight. What's happened? They may be really, really motivated and further reduce the calories to say 1200 calories. And now they're miserable too. And they're, they're probably cold. They're probably cold mm. because the basal metabolic rate has dropped down. And eventually that will work for a short period of time. But then their basal metabolic rate will, will drop to 1200 calories. So they'll plateau again. And so it's a matter of willpower. And when the mil willpower breaks, then they'll start consuming the foods that they've missed. And so then they experience weight gain. So the after after story from a, a reduced calorie diet is often weight regain beyond that that they were at the start of the of the diet. But people blame it on themselves and they say, it's my fault, I didn't try hard enough. So next time that they want to lose weight, they do exactly the same. Now what's happened is called metabolic adaptation. What has happened is their basal metabolic rate has dropped. So their their energy expenditure has dropped down to due to dietary starvation mode. And that's because people have reduced their calories without considering what they're eating. So how do we turn that around is that we educate people to reduce their insulin levels. It's like unlocking the padlock on their, on their energy source. So I have got 110,000 calories of fat stored in my body. I'm quite lean. My She's body, very lean. <laughs> my body Scored percentage is. fat is around 20%. And so, but that gives me 110,000 calories of fat in my body. I should never go hungry. I should never be tired because I should be able to access 
my fat stores. So I've not had breakfast this morning, mm -hmm. so currently I'm fueling off fat. Uh, as soon as I eat, if I had some carbohydrate, then my insulin levels will increase and I will then store that carbohydrate. Um, and so I would no longer then be utilising my fat stores. So the more that people can drive their insulin levels down, the more they can access their fat stores. So rather than counting calories and restricting calories, mm -hmm. it's your view that people just need to keep their insulin down yes. continuously. Yes. So how do we do that? So it's what you eat and when you eat. So carbohydrate is the only nutrient that directly increases insulin levels. So having carbs to tolerance, and we've probably all got a different tolerance rate. Mm -hmm. But also it's considering other factors in the life as well, like sleep and stress. So sleep deprivation, being chronically stressed, increases stress hormones such as cortisol. And what cortisol does is tells our body, especially our liver, to release energy to cope with that stress. The energy release is normally glucose. So we break down our glycogen stores and release glucose. And the liver has got potential to release around 600 grams of glucose in a 24 hour period. So even if people aren't consuming carbohydrate and they're on a low carbohydrate diet, if they're very stressed, not sleeping well, it could be as though they're on a high carbohydrate diet. So even if they're not feeding on carbohydrate, their body is releasing carbohydrate from their glycogen stores, but also making carbohydrate from protein and fat. So every 100 grams of protein somebody eats, they could make 56 grams of glucose. For every 100 grams of fat somebody eats, they could make 10 grams of glucose. So the body, that's why carbohydrate isn't an essential nutrient, because if we don't eat carbohydrate, then we can make it. And so if somebody's got high levels of cortisol, stress hormones, constantly throughout the day, their body's going to be making a lot of glucose. So we need to look at the body holistically. We need to look at our lifestyle. So the top tips really is carbohydrate to tolerance. How will they know their tolerance? Well, if people are meeting their health goals, so they are you know, obtaining and maintaining a healthy weight, if they uh, you know, have healthy blood glucose levels, then it's likely that they're eating carbohydrates to their tolerance level. But if people are struggling with their weight, if they um, are, are told that they've got prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, that suggests that they're eating carbohydrate beyond their carbohydrate tolerance rate. If they were testing their blood glucose, and um, I have a, a, a blood glucose monitor at home that I just occasionally use to see what my blood glucose is after a particular meal, what figure is too high? So um, a level below 5.6 or below is considered healthy. After eating? Um, 5.6? Fasting. This is fasting. Okay, so okay. a fasting level. So fasting first thing in the morning, a level of 5.6 or below is considered really healthy. Uh, Prediabetes is 5.6 or above up to 6.9. And diagnostic of diabetes is 7 or above. Okay, so if you were going to eat something and then wait an hour or so and then test your blood glucose to see your carbohydrate tolerance, what would be too high? Well, normal blood glucose levels is between 3.5 and 7.8. Okay. So, um, you know, down to, so before eating, you know, kind of having a level 3.5, you know, up to 4, 4.5 is absolutely fine. And then uh, one or two hours after eating, you really don't want it seeing above 7.8 or, okay. or 8. Um, uh, pr people, uh, we used to test people with the oral glucose tolerance test yeah. and uh, at two hours if that level was above 11.1 .1, that was also a diagnostic of diabetes. Okay, um, we're up on time but I, I do just want to touch on one more thing with you. Um, you mentioned there about carbohydrates not being an essential nutrient and I've seen there's, there's a lot of um, disturbing discourse in the dietary world at the moment, a lot of disagreement. Um, how do you handle that? Um, I think data. I think when you, because we audit all our, our results, 
and we collect them and currently around two, like, like you said 250,000 people have been through the expert program and we've got well over 100,000 people's results in our audit database and we can demonstrate that when people get the right education that's evidence based and they make changes with their lifestyle especially their diet then it impacts on their clinical outcomes you know they get reduced blood glucose levels they lose weight they keep it off they get a reduced waist circumference so you know outcomes talk mm. uh, I, I would never try and persuade somebody it doesn't work um, but it's about raising awareness and it's about informing people and I guess it's about collaboration yes. rather than kind of arguing in the dietary world it's it that's a waste of energy yeah. waste of energy it must yeah. be better yeah. to work together and yeah. and like you said one size doesn't fit all yeah. and it's great to debate I, I, I enjoy a healthy debate because it's good to hear opposing arguments and to take those away and look at the research and keep an open mind and consider what people are saying uh, Trudy I want to mention to everybody that your website uh, has lots of really interesting information and a great blog as yes, well yes. remind everybody of the address so that's www.xpert, so it's expert without the e, health.org.uk. And uh, do you have a social media handle as well? You're on yes, so we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Brilliant. Trudy, yeah. thank you. Okay. And uh, good luck with your talk later. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay.